So thank you very much, Maharaj, for joining today on this podcast. It's an honor to have you. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. So I have always, whenever I come to Toronto, and I've had your association, it has been very illuminating and inspiring. And uh, you know, you have this distinctive contribution to our movement. Uh, of course, many distinctive contributions, but especially uh, you have. You're among probably the few people in the world who have walked across the whole continent, across Canada. It's twice and across America once, isn't it, Maharaj? Four, four times. Uh, Canada four times. Oh. America once. So maybe we could start, take that as a starting <laughs> point. How, how did you get the inspiration to go across such marathon walks? Was it something you were interested in in your pre-devotional days also? or something which you got inspiration after you started practicing and sharing bhakti? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, I will do that. Thank you very much, Srila Prabhupada Kija. I would uh, just like to say that I started walking when I was about one year old, like most of us. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> okay. when I was five, yeah, when I was five, I started, I walked one mile uh, to um, to my grade school uh, for grade one. Okay. And um, it, it, it's one mile, and I was I did it alone. Um, it was on countryside along the Thames River. We have a Thames River in Canada, so the river winds around. The road kind of graces it, goes, runs parallel to it. So I, I had a nice time. As a kid, I was kind. Of, quite religious and I would think about God. I would think about two people. I would think about God and I would think about Tecumseh. Tecumseh was a, an Indian chief, uh, an indigenous chief. He was a, a, a warrior and he was trying to protect his people. He was, uh, uh, he was uh, one of those great heroes that was uh, you know, trying to keep his culture intact. Uh, as uh, Europeans were coming in, and uh, let's say diluting their cultural values. So he was trying to preserve them. And he even had to fight uh, to keep those values. And at one point, the Americans came to attack Canada. It was the War of 1812. And he thought he was an ally for the British. So, uh, and, and he passed away. He died not far from where I was born. Uh, on the on the river on the Thames River, so um, I, I started to walk and I enjoyed those walks very much. Going there to and fro, so I got my two miles in every day. <laughs> and then, of course, eventually the Canadian system. We went to the metric system, and we go with uh, kilometers. Mm. And so that I got used to that. So how I started walking, um, how it's synchronistic to, um, to my spiritual life. Is I was a fine arts student, and I was going to school in Northern Ontario, taking fine arts, that's painting, sculpture, and all these like, kind of things. And uh, I had relatives, I would hitchhike to their place. So one fine afternoon, it was March, and 1973, and um, I was I had to do a nine mile uh, hitch, you know, to try to get a ride to go back to my apartment, and nobody was stopping. Nobody, and it was a beautiful Saturday afternoon. The sun was shining, but whatever snow was there was melting, and nobody stopped. So I had been reading the Gita, and I had been taking to the practice of Japa and so on like that. And I just felt very frustrated with these people. What, they can't pick up a young college student or give them or do a favor? I just thought, okay, go to your shopping centers, go to your, go to your bars and drink your beer to hell with it. I'm just going to walk. So I walked back. It was a nine-mile stretch, and it took me a few hours. And during that whole process of walking, I was thinking, I like those devotees that I met. They came to my apartment. 
of the monks taught me how to chant Hare Krishna. We went through a morning program together. We had a Bhagavatam class. They uh, had me get off a meet, and uh, they looked at my LPs, long playing record, and they looked at my blues albums, and they felt, why am I looking and listening to blues music? If I just chant, I can be happy. And like Miles Davis, jazz music, I didn't, they said boldly, I don't need to listen to those guys anymore. So I took to heart what they were saying. And uh, I'd been thinking about these things while walking. And I felt for about three months since I met them on a very profound way that I should, I think I'm going to join them. I'm going to join them. I've been thinking about, I'm going to at least try. I'm going to visit them and uh, see what it's like at their temple ashram and see if I like it. And so I went to visit and I made my decision. I made my decision on the spot while I was walking. I'm going to, I have one month yet left to complete my first year's course in fine arts. But my, my spiritual life was more important than anything to me. It's saving my soul more than getting a career and whatever my fine arts endeavors would lead me. So I then decided I'm going to be a Hare Krishna monk. And so it all was in walking, chanting at the same time, and contemplating. It all was uh, done in a synchronized way. And so that was it. So walking became a lifeline. But in 1995, I was the temple president in Toronto. Everything was going kind of strange. Astrologically, I had entered into a Rahu K2 period, apparently. And uh, there was all kind of people gossiping in the community. And I thought, this is ab absolutely too much. I am going to take a different turn in my devotional life. Um, 1996 was the centenary of Prabhupada. He would be 100 years old. Devotees were traveling, or let's say celebrating all over, making plans. And I thought, what am I going to do that will be special and different? So I, um, I've always been sort of a patriotic monk. I like my country, Canada. I thought, let me put my feet, my heart together, and I'm going to walk across the country, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to travel the way Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did it, the way Shankar Acharya did it, the way so many saints did it in the past. They walked long distances in order to meet people. So I decided, 96, I'm going to walk across the country I love, and I'm going to do it the organic way. So that's what transpired. And uh, what was kind of a negative, I turned into a positive through walking. I could then also, I saw so many benefits. I could meet farmers, miners, fishermen, businessmen, uh, young people, old people, all kinds of people on the road. And that's what happened. And I, I could get out of my bubble, you know, away from the temple and away from rich food, too spicy, too oily, or too rich, and eat the kind of food I wanted. And uh, I could also have a little more of experience with Western outreach, you know. And uh, so that, that manifested, and I, I went for that walk. It took me seven and a half months to walk across Canada and to, you know, basically graze along all the Great Lakes and go from West Coast to East Coast, going in the direction of Kolkata, where Prabhupada was born, just to remember him. And I was most days doing 64 rounds. And uh, it, was, it worked. Uh, and I got to expose Krishna consciousness through the media. And in the 96, a lot of, like, we, there was a lot of bad press about us um, for some time. We were still, people were determined, the public was determined that we were a cult. We were a sinister group, uh, not knowing that they, we have ties with an ancient practice from India, India 
particularly Hinduism. People were a little not informed. And then around 96 also, when I was walking, there was, uh, there, there was a first leak out of child abuse issues that we had. Like many institutions had this problem, uh, secular and spiritual. And so I thought, I want to be out here when it's important to be out here. I want to do something positive for my country, for human society. And, uh, and so I think it worked. I got over my fear, shyness of dealing with journalists and reporters. And uh, I was getting a lot of encouragement, especially from the Western folks. Interesting enough, you'll find that I wasn't getting the same kind of encouragement from my peers, from my colleagues, devotees, God brothers, um, especially when I did a second walk. Why are you doing this again? It's just for yourself. Um, that, that, those kind of rumblings I was hearing in the back. And uh, I, I didn't pay too much attention to it. I actually had to go on this walk and previous walks just to, to be able to deal with uh, administrative headaches, to deal with the challenges that exist sometimes within our society. I had to do it to save myself. And I would say these long walks and the dramas that I do are, are keeping me going. And I love my God brothers and I love the devotees and so on. But, you know, you get these fanatical elements where devotees will say, well, you're really supposed, you're not supposed to walk. You're supposed to be in a jet. Save yourself some time. And you should, you know, <laughs> you should just, you know, go and do it like everybody else does, you know. And uh, I said, no, 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 I'm going to do it the way, the way I want to. This is good for my health. It's good for my mind. I'm getting a lot of speaking engagements. And I'm meeting all kinds of Christians, Buddhists, uh, Muslims, uh, Native people, spirituals, people of all kinds. This is, and I'm sleeping in a tent at night. And I'm getting up and I'm getting the sun shining getting my vitamin D, my vitamin C, and I believe I'm doing what's right. So, uh, Hare Krishna. <laughs> That's a little bit of a <laughs> That's amazing. So, so Maj, what you and, put, just, uh, yeah, a couple of yeah, thoughts if you want about to, this. Yeah. So, it seems that, uh, to some extent, for all of us, when we are practicing bhakti, uh, we need to find our nature. So for you, walking and uh, contemplating, that was something which you were doing before, and then you have you had to, to some extent, fight to create that space for yourself to do something similar That's right. within bhakti. And uh, absolutely, yeah. So in some ways, you know, I was also. Of course, you could say, sir, from a physical perspective, I am the opposite of you. You know, I am physically very inactive because of whatever reasons. And since I came to India from the last three months, I haven't gone out of the room where I am in because of the lockdown. <laughs> but um, for me, I could say that I was also... Oh, God. <laughs> so hopefully I should be able to move out in a few days. But... Um, it's that for me, I was always I like to think and speak and write, especially write. So I also had to create mm. some space for writing because like uh, the, the second point, you know, that to some extent, uh, we as a movement uh, assess success in certain predefined terms. You know, we define success mm. maybe in terms of say, how many books were distributed or how many temples were built or how many devotees were made in terms of people becoming initiated or people becoming people chant, taking up chanting seriously. So there is also a little more osmotic or subtle way of outreach where we create friends and well-wishers who may not really become devotees in the technical sense of the word. 
and that kind of outreach mm. is not so much recognized or valued you know although prabhupad himself did that in india when he was here most of the times what he did was making life members the life members were not really committed devotees but uh, so that kind of outreach where uh, say like you said you meet different kinds of people and then you are able to uh, <clears throat> speak to them and share krishna bhakti at a, we could say where it's not directly converting them but it's like maybe infusing some some amount of spirituality or bhakti within what they are doing so uh, do you also find this fulfilling or how do you see the uh, see the success or the effectiveness of what you are doing so these are two distinct questions maybe like we have had certain definitions of success in our movement and then there are some right. other well, uh, yeah so this, are, uh, yeah go ahead Please. thank you for bringing up those points i believe that prabhupad was very much into figures numbers um he uh, he saw how we were young westerners very energetic very enthusiastic and had a competitive edge to our way of being so uh, he encouraged that so he encouraged book distribution he was interested in numbers he was interested in how many centers we open how many devotees were coming along people their people's lives being changed that that's very true so how that translates for me is that how many miles am i doing or how many oh. kilometers <laughs> am i covering <laughs> that's beautiful like i had i had 10, 10 i had 10 provinces to do and i was offering them to krishna right and uh, there was an interesting social political thing that happened 1995 the year before canada almost lost its biggest province Quebec, which is the French sort of branch of, um, of Canada, the French speaking population. And there was a vote there and it was very close. We were very close to, to losing Quebec because a lot of Quebecers were thinking that uh, let us be like Scotland is to the UK. And most Canadians didn't want that. And uh, the votes were very tight. So it was another reason, motivation behind my walking. But, uh, you know, let's go back a little bit. My whole approach in the walking was to reach out to people like never before. And I would say on the average, it's just kind of like a contemplation. I think every day I was reaching out to one to 2,000 people average every day while I was walking. How? Well, uh, through the radio through because Canadians, you know, we're very isolated, we're sparsely populated, so, and Canadians probably drive more than anybody else in the world. Uh, they go on long distances to go to work and so on. So they listen to the radio. And so I got on the radio through the radio waves, newspapers, which were still quite popular at that time, and also television broadcasts. So I was figuring out on the average, I was reaching out to a lot of people. And then also, uh, when it comes to numbers, uh, I was getting Bhagavad Gita installed in every library across the country. You know, Prabhupada's Gita, Bhagavad Gita as it is. So numbers were important to me, but at the same time, I felt that I had to do like a friendship walk. Um, it was most people who do marathons, like cycling or sometimes you have runners they're raising awareness for some cause for fighting cancer or something like that there's a famous terry fox canadian boy who who had one leg and he had artificial leg what his real leg in art, and he ran across the country and he was raising awareness about cancer he only went halfway but so he was raising money but I wasn't raising money, I was raising friends. And I tell the media that, you know, the journalists say, so what are you doing this for? And I say, well, I'm doing this uh, as a friend raiser, not a fundraiser. And say, oh, I like that. I'm gonna write that down in my, you know, you know <laughs> stuff like that. So the idea is that because we had bad press, 
in North America and the West for some time uh, under the umbrella of that, the charge that we are brainwashing cult. And now children who like the abuse, I felt I wanted to have to do something positive. I, I felt very dear to the movement and I wanted Prabhupada's movement to be accepted. Not even if it wasn't honored, but I wanted to be accepted. There's different stages from, uh, let's say, uh, being scorned to being accepted and from going for an acceptance to even be, being cool, you know? So now I find that, you know, after the years have passed, wherever I walk, especially in North America or Western countries, and of course in India it's no exception, but people just find you cool because we look like Buddhists and Buddhists have got a good reputation. Uh, the Hindu monks to some degree, uh, but especially the Buddhists right now. So many people mistake us for being Buddhist. So one of my reasons for being out there is to also to clarify, I'm not Buddhist, I'm a Hare Krishna, clearly Hare Krishna, which is uh, an older tradition than Buddhism. In fact, Buddhism sprang from the older tradition, the Vedic culture of India. So I have a chance to clarify all these things. And you know, people admire it. They, they expect monks to do something uh, kind of, let's say, mind over matter-ish. And uh, when you're walking across the vast land, they think, wow, you're doing that? Well, that's amazing. How do you do it? I wish I could do that. But I have to go to work, or I have to go to school. I got my girlfriend, I can't just leave her, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and uh, so they, they, they look up to you, you know, especially young guys, they'll pull over. And um, they, they understand that you're kind of like a man of steel. It's kind of that, that kind of uh, imagery comes across. And so they start to respect, from acceptance to respect. And uh, so, it was through the media channels that helped a lot. And if I didn't approach the, these outlets from the media, uh, the press and so on like that, I, I don't think it would have been, my walks would have been as recognized. So uh, all this, this was strategy to help turn things around a bit. And, uh, and also for me personally, to make a change in my, the way I was executing Christian consciousness, from an administrative role to kind of like sabbatical, <laughs> but on the road. And uh, I felt I was being blessed. I also personally felt very benefited by walking, by, uh, by, by greeting the sun every day, or, and the moon, nighttime walking, and, and the wind. And I, I could, you know, chapters like 8, 9, 10 uh, from the Gita and, and 11, they were starting to open up to me where you see God in rain and sun and uh, feeling it, not just reading about it, but now feeling it, experiencing it, and, and going through the incredible heat uh, in some cases in the summertime and snowstorms and just plowing through it. And, and doing because you, you believe it's going to help you to build character uh, and uh, a, a, maybe an extra a thin layer of bhakti, you know. So I, I, I felt I was gaining in many ways all around. And uh, I made nice contacts with people along the way, uh, at yoga studios, churches, we had speaking engagements. Hindu gatherings as well. And I also had a chance to visit my Prabhupada's temples across Canada. And when I was in the US, the same thing. And uh, I discovered that there's lots of nice people out there that want Krishna consciousness. They're starving for association from sannyasis and brahmacharis. They love us out there. That's the thing. They love us, you know, and, uh, but if you stay away, they can't love you, <laughs> out of sight, out of mind. 
And another thing that I glean from this experience is that our movement in the West is somewhat known as a religion. And that has a drawback. Religions are not so popular. Um, the public has looked at religion and say, oh, you, you guys are, um, let's say you're, the, you're aggressive, you're in your bubble, uh, you don't meet with people, you don't mix, you're in on your own little world, you just want to convert people, you don't want to be our friends. And uh, there's been so much in the media, especially from the Catholic Church of child abuse, um, you know, and, uh, and from the Islamic branch, you know, aggressiveness, blowing up buildings and Buddha statues and things like that. So a lot of people have turned atheist, and I wanted to meet them and shake their hands and wish them well, spend a little time investing in our spirituality as much as we do with our senses. And uh, so those are a few other additional points. Oh, thank you. Going I hope that may answer some of the questions here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what I did want to say too is that I believe that our movement has to become more people-centric, uh, meaning that we must show concern for people, even to the point of saying we're concerned about their about humanitarianism, and um, so we we have got this profile portfolio very much a profile of being highly ritualistic and uh, in the West I would say people don't always understand what are deities it's not important to them it's not relevant but what they do like they do like chanting they do like kirtan they like to talk a little bit philosophical and they like good food so I believe those are the main uh, packaging components of Krishna consciousness that we must present. Uh, many of our leaders are concerned about getting the puja done, getting the offerings done, the cooking and making sure, and then at the expense of missing out on taking care of people's lives. So I believe that we should at least balance it out. The puja is important but we must give more, much more time and invest money into outreach, getting out there to make people our friends and to make them friends, turn them into friends for Krishna. So that is my, let's say, take on it. I, I believe that we should make some adjustments, even if it means to simplify our puja. In the Indian temples, we have lots of brahmacharis, pujaris, and so on. In the West, that's not the case. We've got good people in the West. They're very talented. And but there's also a need to reach out to our Western community as much as we are looked after and look to the help of our Southeast Asian community devotees. There's a need to be more relevant to the Western public and to make it attract and get them to want to come. Mm. So a famous letter that Prabhupada sent to a devotee in Toronto, he said that, I see wherever I go, people are not coming to the temples. Therefore, we should have you know restaurants and he's talking about reading rooms and things of that nature. You know, we should have Goes, we should have a setup which will draw people, which will be significant or relevant to them, which will draw their attention. And of course, eventually people will go to deities. So that's the point. Um, and I, interesting. I think that that's, those are some of the realizations that came about from my experience and walking and meeting people from different, uh, let's say, ways modes of life.
Hmm. It's interesting you mentioned about uh, Prabhupada's letter to a devotee in Toronto. Uh, I've seen that when Prabhupada was in New Zealand also, he made a similar letter that people are not interested in coming to temples, create reading rooms. So, reading rooms where people can come and hear and read. Right. So, so I think that translates as a, more like a loungy kind of setup where people are kind of relaxed. We see that people are very attracted to uh, coffee shops where it's a nice relaxed atmosphere. People can sit around a table and look at each other and communicate like that because we now live in a world where the family unit has kind of disintegrated and uh, no longer do we have those strong bonds of support. So people are kind of left more on their own now and they find some comfort in sipping on coffee and chatting. And uh, if we create that kind of an atmosphere, not necessarily with coffee, but a coffee replacement perhaps, and with some nice food around, I think that can make a big difference. Churches are empty. Spiritual places are empty. But where people do go is they go to, like here in Canada, we have what's called Tim Horton's shop. They're just all over the place. They are the meeting places. They, it's like Starbucks. It is the, they are the places to go to, to, to meet with your friends and connect and a chance to chill. So if we create those kind of environments with prashadam and with the right kind of food, preferably vegan as opposed to dairy, then we'll get a lot of intelligent people coming around. And uh, I feel that we're failing when we just concentrate on having a temple with deities and just trying to get six or seven offerings done every day. We're failing. We're not relevant. We're, we've, we're more or less saying uh, that we're blocking ourselves out from your, your existence. And I, I think it's flawed. I really do. And I've been looking at this trend for 47 years now. Uh, that's as long as I've been in the movement. And I see that uh, this is our big challenge. How are we actually going to get people to come around and take some interest? And now the, uh, the new challenge is, though, people don't read books. So, you know, do we have a good, do we have a strong presence, uh, the online? And I think maybe we can improve in that area as well. So we just have to be a little bit pliable, bendable, flexible. Um, and, um, and, and then I think we can succeed. But we have to have a good hard look at ourselves, uh, a good vision. If we want to just follow the model of what goes on in India, we will actually not succeed in the West. So I think a lot of emphasis has to go into how we can progress and proceed in, uh, in other parts of the world and not just follow the, the model in India. But we must stick to the essence, uh, which is kirtan, chanting, for instance, and, and food is very important. People are health conscious now, and a little bit of philosophy. Let people know we're not these bodies, we're spirits, and get off the bodily platform. As now, with the, uh, with the riots and marches that are going on all over, it's all very much about, you know, kind of like the, with these racist uh, edges, you know, it's, it's putting a lot of, um, giving a lot of challenges to society right now. Just what you were saying, children, children I had to find my own niche. Um, I, I, there's a lot of things I like to do. I like cooking in the kitchen. I like leading kirtan. I like giving classes. I love doing the theater. And I also like doing walking. And uh, I felt I just had to especially take up walking. And uh, But I guess what I 
my, what I'm saying to you now is very, let's say, endearing for me. And I, I would like to, I wish I could say it loud and clear that we have to do something to see whatever it takes to get people to show some more interest in us and go from the stage of acceptance and even respect to the point where I want to commit myself to Krishna consciousness. And commitment is not a strong thing in people's lives right now. Um, marriages are failing, commitment uh, that way. People quit easy on each other. <laughs> people are, it used to be that like my dad's generation, he'd work at a factory for 30 years straight and get an honor for that. Uh, you'd live in the same house. You know, but, but everyone's moving, people's jobs are changing, and our level, level of tolerance is not very strong. So um, with this kind of like fleeting nature of the culture in which we now live makes it a little more tough for us to get people to anchor themselves in Krishna consciousness. So I think the real success will lie in, and the way Varnashram could spread is that Whatever people are basically doing, accept them for what they are. Just add Krishna. Instead of saying, just give it all up, what you're doing is bad, it's wrong, get up. Um, you know, you, you should just be living in the temple, uh, you should be living a life of celibacy, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think it's going to be more attractive if we present ourselves in a more inclusive way as opposed to exclusive. Yeah. Yes, no, that's true. Definitely. Couple of points about this that when you said that in your father's generation or you know, people would work in the same job and work in, you know, live in the same house, people were committed to each other. Nice way of putting that people quit on other people very easily nowadays. That's a very oh, yeah. insightful way of putting it that if, in a sense, we have become pessimistic about each other. We have become mm -hmm. pessimistic about, about the potential for relationships to blossom and shelter. So, you know, there is sometimes a, a dynamic, in, especially among Indians, about Indian culture and Western culture. But then the way you are describing it, even what we call currently as Western culture is quite different from, say, what was the culture in now the West is also a very big construct. West, you can have Europe, you can have America, right. you can have Canada. But still, if we take it as a one inclusive term, so maybe it could be that instead of contrasting between Western and Indian culture, it would be more of a, a contrast between, say, maybe spiritual culture and a material materialistic culture, or maybe a a, right. a pre-modern, like a modern and post-modern culture, or something like that. I'm not sure whether that polarization yes. is necessarily accurate. That that dialectic. Uh, I, I can I can agree with what you're saying. Going back to my dad's generation, people were more God fearing, church going, and you wouldn't find anybody that like if anybody said they were atheists, they wouldn't dare say that. But now people say it with pride. Yeah. And uh, surely. Uh, Divorce was pretty much out of the question. It's not even a thought, or maybe a thought, but never put into action. Uh, you know, divorce was just something that movie stars did. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, so the, the values have changed. Uh, yes, old value, old school, as opposed to modern way of thinking. Um, I would say that there was a lot of gold in the old, and uh, we've lost a grip on those things. Um, we have been become very spoiled or distracted by so many objects, so many choices, where there, in more simpler times, uh, it was just a regular practice to be happy with kind of what you have, and uh, especially for people who went through wars and depressions uh they really valued what they had and they were happy to have a job and to have food at the table 
and to have each other. That's really important. And um, they were happy when somebody would come to the door. Uh, oh, come on in. Nowadays, someone knocks on your door. Hey, get out, get away, get away from the door. Get under the couch. It's a terrorist. <laughs> it's, just, it's a different kind of world we live in. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah, but like in ISKCON, when we say Western culture, Eastern culture, well, Western culture was also quite God-centered, you know, not so long ago. And Indian culture is also, let's say, diminishing its, uh, uh, in its uh, spiritual participation. So it's really all really a wave of Kali Yuga, type of tsunami of, uh, of, of materialism, really. And uh, I think that is a good comparison, the material versus the spiritual, you know, cultures. And uh, I believe that we have to play a major role in maybe repackage spirituality. And I think what the public doesn't like is hypocrisy. Like if you are a priest in a culture, or you're a rabbi or a Brahmin or a brahmachari, people expect that a certain behavior goes along with it. Like when I was doing these, uh, doing the marathon walks, People express, well, you're a monk, so you do these kind of things, you know? And uh, they, they see that you're genuine. They want you to come across as genuine. And not just to be eager or hungry for, uh, for super recruitment, you know? Of course, we do have that interest. We want people to come to the side of Krishna, but just how we do it, I think one important principle is that you're going to gain more acceptance from people by good behavior than by knocking people over the head with the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> you know, an example is better than three such, as Prabhupada said. And um, then Francis of Assisi, he once said, this is an, an Italian saint, his remark was, preach. And if you have to, use some words. So with that quote, he's saying, act in such a way that people want to be with you, as opposed to convincing them that they have to change their whole life. So there's, I think with the two-pronged system, yeah, our behavior must be good. We have to show that we're happy people. We're hygienic. Uh, we 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 plan our lives. And, you know, we're organized. I think people like all those. Like, they see you. You guys are stable, and uh, uh, that's important. And uh, at the same time, um, we're not. We can also convince them to about the benefits of being nonviolent and so on like that. So our teaching is important on two ways, by what we say and by what we do. Yeah. A typical uh, saying among the spiritual but not religious people is that don't tell me what you believe, show me how you behave. So that's exactly what you're saying also. That uh, now, just uh, elaborating on a couple of the points which you made, that uh, when we are trying to reach out to people, not so much to like, recruit them into a cult, but help them, say, become better human beings, help them become more spiritual where they are. So. When Srila Prabhupada started his movement in America, at that time, the mood was very much of recruitment. Because yes. in one sense, practicing bhakti, uh, bhakti was so different from the mainstream culture that for, and most of the devotees who joined at that time, they were also not so much rooted in their family structures or whatever. So for them, the sustainable environment for practicing bhakti was moving into the temple itself. 
now right and now for now in the west for indians most indians who go there they already have a reasonably stable family structure and within that they practice bhakti well so if uh, western devotees are western people are to start practicing bhakti uh, do you think it is possible for them within the mainstream culture that is there in the west say for example say drinking meat eat now meat eating is not that meat at least veganism is becoming a little cool but still uh, the mainstream in the mainstream western culture there are a lot of things which might make practicing bhakti quite difficult so for our movement to grow do can we really expect that a lot of western people will come to the level of becoming initiated devotees who follow the four regulatory principles and chant 16 rounds or might we need some other more expanded definition of connection with connection with our movement where people will be affiliated in some way but maybe they may not come up to the level of initiated devotees so for our western outreach do you envision the need for something like this oh yes and i believe that shila prabhupad had set up something for us through our rural developments so What? because as you mentioned vegan rural uh, countryside developments okay uh farming agriculture uh, agrarian uh, culture mm. um that is uh, taking care of the land the animals the kind of people that would be very drawn to our movement uh in the west are people of that nature um that is when we take become good stewards of the of the planet and uh grow nice organic food and that type of thing i i believe that was the direction prabhupad was giving us in as much as um let's say the urbanized krishna consciousness was important he also saw the need for rural development uh in the countryside and uh because you have a controlled environment and uh it's so much more sattvic in the mode of goodness and uh that's what resonates just look at the popular religion for young people today is not institutional it's more about protecting the earth it's environmentalism and uh, that is the perhaps the most important thing in their life um i was looking at one particular survey that was done comparing some european youths to indian youths like in a city like delhi and uh the the european youths were more radically thinking about well we have to think about the planet that was like the foremost thing in their mind whether they were doing anything to improve the planet conditions or not that's another thing and when it came to the indians while their uh religion was important to them getting their career getting their job getting that kind of stability was perhaps more important you know so just to compare same age group same age bracket and yet the thrust was a little bit different so that article i looked at about 10 years ago i don't know if it's changed much but i know that if we can if we can get over that hurdle go through that hoop of showing demonstrating wholesome living in a more rural environment with good food and not less capitalism uh i think that it will attract an intelligent sector of society in the west and um spiritual is a popular word religion is not hmm. so right now in this country we have the semblance of being a religion you know and that's just yeah. not cool it's just not cool but but spirituality is that that resonates more as a you know genuine life living living for the spirit living for um in towards infinity 
real living. I mean, that's the way people think, whether they would actually can stick at, stick to something or not, that's another problem. Because it's not so easy to get someone to go and work your butt off <laughs> mm. in the outdoors, you know. It's not so easy. But I think we, uh, we, we should put a little more emphasis in that direction, for sure. Yeah. So now from what I re read about Prabhupada talking about the farm community, one of the things he said is that you save time so that you can chant Hare Krishna more. So now, so what you are saying is uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat more contemporary connection with uh, a rural community. So you are saying that even if people don't necessarily come to the standards of uh, say initiated devotees, but they could, there, are, there is a way of people who want to have a more wholesome way of living close to nature and they could more easily incorporate the principles of bhakti at a level that they are comfortable with. And in some ways, uh, a rural way of living, a more eco-friendly way of living will also be more bhakti friendly whereas a more urban way of living might be less bhakti friendly is that where you are going by this point yes yes definitely the uh, sort of if we live in an environment in the countryside is naturally more subject whereas in the city it's high and intense rajas passion uh, city life is a place of many distractions and uh, if, if we can, people can just just slow down, just like the, the beauty of the pandemic dynamic is that people have been forced to slow down. You know, they don't have as much, many funds to play around with. Um, they're forced to, you know, think about rationing their food, and people are definitely walking much more. What I see in the city here, where I am, is that you've got triple, quadruple the number of pedestrians from what it was before. So I, that's a good thing. People are experiencing what is sunshine. And of course, I, I'm not a great person to prescribe to, you know, staying indoors all the time, you know. <laughs> of course, India and the city, it's a different thing. But uh, if you have a place where there's ample room where you can keep yourself distanced in a, in, in a disciplined way, then uh, I think it's very favorable to build up your resistance and your immunity. So, um, so many studies have been done for children who grew up on the countryside, on the farm, as opposed to kids that grew up in the city. Um, you've got all kinds of, uh, what do you call it? People are allergic, allergies, you know, for people who live in the city. But when you're a countryside, you smell manure, you smell plants, some that are obnoxious, some that are sweet. You, every, you've, you've got experience of bugs coming on you. You've, you've gone, you've seen everything. You know, you collect, you catch the frogs, you chase after the snakes or they chase you. You know, you've got all this experience that is favorable for the body to build up its inner strength. And so that's another problem. Um, it's just a more wholesome way of life. And because, you know, if you're out in the countryside, you're stuck with the stars <laughs> at night. <laughs> you're, you're stuck with the rainbows, you know, uh, after a rain. And, uh, but that, those are not the experiences in the city, you know. We've created this superficial lifestyle. The lights will be on 24 hours. And, uh, but really the sun and the moon are telling us something different. So I think we'll live longer, we'll live healthier, um, and uh, let's say if it can be God-centric, we're just in a better position. It's so much easier to think of Krishna. And here's one thing. One of my friends, he did a lot of studying about marathon walking. He said, anybody who does this long distance kind of like travel, they all end up believing in God at the end. God is important in their life. So it's all about 
being an outdoors, meeting with people, being embracing the elements makes makes a big difference. So I would just say to devotees too, maximize some of your time, or at least put more time into the out of doors. And if it's hot in India, do it in the do it in the nighttime. <laughs> just get out there and see Krishna in the form of fresh air, where the real prana is, and get the sun in the early morning or in the nighttime. And, you know, spend a little, little less time away from your screens. Just learn to say no, you know, to some of these, these things that have become like our teddy bears. <laughs> oh, God. Yes, yeah, and, uh, and, and get that balance that you need in life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Maharaj. That's a, I think that's a message which uh, everybody can apply. Not, not everybody may be able to move to a rural setting, but finding some, some space, some time to come closer to nature mm -hmm. wherever we are is something which all, we all can do. And I think the Bhagavatam is also quite filled with meditations of how from nature we go toward Krishna. The third canto, yes. the second canto. That's true. Yes, Maharaj. So, uh, it, is, it was wonderful talking with you, Maharaj. Are there any other concluding points that you would like to say? As such? Well, uh, I was... I, would, I was wondering if I could just share with you a poem. Yes, please. I just uh, paraphrased the Shikshastakam, and I call it Chaitanya's Verses. I put it so that it rhymes in the English language. Okay. And uh, so if, if you'd just like to listen, yes, I please. wanted to share that with you, because yes, I do spend some time writing poetry. Oh, you know, okay. So here we are. Chaitanya's verses. <clears throat> Victory to the sacred sound that cleanses all around. There's filth in the heart piled up from the start. Many births of desires have burst up like fires. Therefore, the kirtan charge is for humanity at large. It's a practice so cool like the rays of the moon. It's the fruit of wisdom with joy that's arisen. So sweet to the taste, we go there with great haste. Beautiful. You, who, <laughs> that's the first verse. Yeah. You, you who are divine, this sound is sublime. With thousands of names, they all are the same. In them, all energies are invested. The names are tested. Rules, not hard and fast. It's easy to pass. Out of sheer kindness, the sound is sure to bind us. Attractive, accessible, approachable, doable. But what is most unfortunate is that I can't always appreciate. To approach the sound, one must be humbly bound like the straw in the street. One has to be meek, like a tall, stout tree, tolerant as can be. I'm telling you, brother, it's the ego we have to smother. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Respect is how it should be. With the right attitude, the constant sound has platitude. O oh, power, behind the universe. I'm not looking to be fabulously rich, not to be overwhelmed by the lustful itch, nor entangled in the name fame hitch. I'll have my bhakti list, though births persist. O oh, son of Nanda, I love you and I will assist you, but I'm in an ocean drowning without devotion. Pick me up from this ocean of death before my last breath. While those lotus feet are handsome, 
place me there like an atom. When will the time come when tears of love will run and flow so constantly while chanting in ecstasy? When will my voice choke up in the course of shake-up? When will hairs stand on end as we chant to transcend? Govinda is your name. Separation makes me insane. One moment lasts forever, like 12 years or whatever. Tears come like rain. Your absence gives such pain. This vacancy in life creates so much strife. But I know only you as my lover. There is no other. Even when it's rough, I'll never have enough of heartfelt embrace or when we find no trace of you and your freedom to act. So I'll state the fact that I love you. I love you. I always will love you. Hare Krishna. Beautiful, Varaj. <laughs> it's not only rhyming, it's not only accurately reflecting uh, each verse, but it's presented in such a way that uh, it's so universal that mm. if you recite this, if you recite even a verse from this to a new person, then right. it is something which they can, oh, this is any person who has an appreciation for some, kind, some level of devotion to God, they can appreciate these right. prayers. It's beautiful. Is it possible you could send it to me? If you have it on your website, we can post a link in the YouTube description also so that the viewers uh, can... I'd be happy to send it to you, Chidanshar. I'd be happy to do that. And I just want to say that uh, because you asked for any last remarks, I believe that we have to really look, relook at our presentation and make things much more relevant. And even when it comes to language, the word God might not be something that people can uh, relate to so much but if you say the divine or the supreme and um, in our presentations if you talk about demons and devotees that also doesn't even a word like sin may not uh, be appropriate word nowadays you know yeah. and even the word preach preach is something like it comes from a religious background not a spiritual Preach means, it's a word that says, I know everything, you know nothing. Shut your mouth, I'm going to, going to make you understand God. <laughs> so it's, uh, we have to look at our language. Uh, the world is changing, and we have to look at more contemporary choice of words as opposed to some of the old ones. We're, we're, we have become accustomed to Victorian-type English, what Prabhupada was familiar with. Uh, and um, I think that we just have to get a little more up to speed with uh, the way people may speak now. Yeah. So the universal appeal, as you use that term, I, uh, I would vouch for that. <laughs> yeah. It's true. You know, there's a, one of my friends who studied English literature. And then I, it was a pre-devotional friend, uh, and then he he got introduced to me. He's, then we reconnected, and then he heard some of my classes, and then he heard. And this was about 10, 15 years ago, and I had just become come new to bhakti. So he, the first thing he told me is that, why are you speaking in nineteen thirties English? <laughs> why are you, speak, why are you speaking again? in 1930s, 1920s English? 1920s, 1930s yeah, right. English. That's the first thing right, he commented right. to me. That was very interesting. That yes, I was yes. speaking in 2005, you, but most of my exposure to to philosophy was through Shri Prabhupada's books, and um, right. the, and I thought at one at one time that using exactly those words is a testament to my faithfulness to Prabhupada. But, right. You know, ultimately, we have to get the message across. And if people right. are just getting question marks by hearing that message or hearing the words we are using, 
then adjusting is I, I, adjusting the words is quite important and i noticed that even prabhupad has used words differently at different times so for yes. example in his journey to other planets he has used the word anti matter for spirit you know just yes. because at that time the matter and anti matter were in common so even one sense prabhupad was contemporary like our sunday love feast or go high, stay high forever prabhupad did use those kind of phrases <laughs> yes yeah, so that's right striking point and i believe prabhupad wanted us to adjust according to the time place and circumstance he wanted us to use words that that people can appreciate that it, that's attractive to them and as much as like say um if i'm in a french speaking part of canada i should speak french so in the same way like time change is such that we must use the language that's more contemporary in our delivery and then people will take us more seriously for sure yes you know that's a striking point maharaj that say if if we go to france you will have to speak french but yes so, but in a sense it's english but english in the 19th century english in the first half of the 20th century english in the second half of the 20th century english in the 21st century they are actually not the same language they are right. it the same but it's significantly different so today yes. we won't use the thy thou in talking with each other <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so and, and you know i think it's that uh, we have to capture the essence of things and it's not so much what the prophet say verbatim what did he mean you know my good friend sachiraj from new york he said that was not so much like say for instance in, in the bhagavatam there's a famous quote there prophet says women enjoy being raped okay what did he mean by that if you take it in modern day context that would be taboo you know people say i'm i'm walking away but if we understand something like men or you know women or men they enjoy being seduced then it's something a little different as a different connotation so we have to be smart about these things and understand yeah. the language of today and what it means you know that's true yeah you know that same word that's such a provocative purport you know there is a ralph griffith who translated several indian epics into english and then he was almost 100 years ago and uh, something like that and then his books came in the public domain after 75 years of copyright got over so then he had a chapter in his ramayan translation called the rape of sita and <laughs> on just seeing that title there was like a furor among so many ramayan lovers so many hindus but then right. classified that there is the word rape at that time means abduction it doesn't mean violation right. so right right words do have different connotations right right and so that that's that so we're talking about you know dividing the line between kind of like left wing right wing um fanaticism to realism and so on thing we have to look at those uh, those items yeah. yes maharaj so you know it would be interesting to look at some words that we have already retired say for example prabhupad used the word cult but we don't use that word the cult of chaitanya mahaprabhu prabhupad would say but we don't use that word at all so right a cult we have retired but there are some other words also which we may want to retire so sinful is definitely one word divine uh, i think the supreme is okay is it god i know is not so cool like uh, yeah that's right <laughs> in some ways in the star wars movie they talk about force and the force is almost yeah. like a all pervading idea of god but right right but you know in those same movies if instead of may the force be with you if the character started saying may god be with you the theaters would become empty <laughs> so yeah that's right <laughs> so in that sense uh, i i say may the source be with you and they might yeah. live with that <laughs> that's clever with the stories be with you <laughs> yeah yeah so is it I, i think it's in our delivery of krishna consciousness we are compelled to 
use our intelligence uh, to uh, reach out to people. It's got to be attractive for them, you know. If it means that an ice cream cone, you put a cherry on top to make it that much more attractive and get the cherries, you know, make that little extra effort. So we need to find the words that will be important to us. And if we just stick, I mean, this is for BBT trustees, you know, looking at the books, they really have to look at some of the words and uh, put things in such a way that would, but they should consider, you know, the language adjustments, you know. Like say, for instance, generically, if everything's he, 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 and there's no she, 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 then you're eliminating half of the population. Because these days, you know, you're not, you have to speak to women as much as you have to men. You know, it's, it's got to be a fair share of words. So I think that anybody who's writing, you know, can, the contemporary for a contemporary audience must look at those principles. And then we also should give some thought to what that would mean for our own BBT books, you know. Maybe we would need some footnotes or some more clear explanations. So that's what I wanted to say as well. Yes, <laughs> uh, otherwise, it will be embarrassing to, to present books in such a way that are kind of outdated language-wise. It, 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 people will not be able to appreciate it. Like last year, we went to a summer event, and we had a book table, and a lady picked up a book, and then she started reading and said, she came back a half hour later and said, no, I don't want this book, I want another book. This sounds too religious for me. <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah. But she was ready. She, we went for a trade, and uh, she, one particular book she picked up was sound a little more secular, but had the same message. You know? So our choice of words are very important. Mm -hmm. uh, everything, you know, the, our temple, how we look, and, and, and the way we dress. Presentation is, uh, presentation is power, you know, it's, it's important. How we, how we appear um, to the public, it, it should be in such a way that will draw people in, not repel them. <laughs> That's true. Yes. Well, maybe regarding these words, we could go up and what are the alternatives we could use? Say, for example, like for God, you talked about some alternatives. For cult, we can use the word movement. I think movement is better than institution also. Movement or tradition. Yes, movement. Or, uh, or right. tradition. tradition. What would be an alternative for sinful? I sometimes use the word wrongdoing, but still wrongdoing also has a certain... Uh, I don't know what if that is sinful. That is. Uh, I would, well, <laughs> well, we're getting into details here, splitting yeah. hairs. Uh, I would say negative karma. That's a good when word. You speak yeah. In terms of yeah, that's you know, that's, like that's nice. It, it depends. Like, say, if I was to, especially in the United States, there's some uh, parts of America they're very much into God, and they'll, they'll stick to that language and sin and so on like that. But I think the mainstream public can't relate to that. So uh, when you say negative karma or negative actions or, you know, like that. Yeah, I think negative karma is a very good word. It is, mm. it is non-judgmental. So it's more like, yes. in, to some extent, it is more an attribute of the activity rather than uh, attribute of the person. We are not judging the mm -hmm. person. But it's more like we are right. evaluating the activity. So it doesn't seem to be right. that threatening then. Right. Exactly. Judge the sin, not the sinner. Yes. <laughs> now, even there are some <laughs> other words. I was thinking that uh, even lust can sometimes sound a little too strong or value judgmental. And mm -hmm. I found that the word craving is much more palatable. And it's also right. more inclusive when we consider today's context. Mm -hmm. So that's right. Yeah. So this this actually right. could also be an interesting exercise. What all words mm -hmm. uh, we could use to convey things in a way that is not so jarring. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So yeah, I agree with you. I like that word craving as well. 
I think that's a very excellent word to use. Mm -hmm. Maharaj. Yes. So at what point would the adjustment or changing of words lead to a, is there one thing is sensi being sensitive to the audience and the second is diluting the message. So if we use negative karma, we are not diluting the message. We are using the word yes, craving instead of say uh, lust. We are still conveying the message, isn't it? So I right. don't think changing the words or adapting the words to a particular context would would necessarily lead to dilution of the message. Say, but mm -hmm. what, what if, for example, if instead of sex, we use the word physical intimacy, would that would you consider that a dilution, or or that's that's okay? Well, people love the word sex, whichever way you use it. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> no, but then, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> it's just so much in your face everywhere. But if we're trying to oh, but subdue they... that activity. Yeah, I, I, I use the word uh, intimacy, you know, intimacy, yeah. Physical have... intimacy, I okay. use it, yeah. No, so that affects right. very much that that idea is common in people's mind. But is it something yes. that they may expect a monk to speak? You know, sometimes because when we use the word when we talk about sex, often it is in a in a way that it is it is sinful. And mm. so in that sense, there is a lot of negativity associated with it. So Right. I, so so well, what we say we we say no illicit sex and I think a better terminology there would be no casual sex. You know? That's uh, good, right? That, yeah. <laughs> no casual sex. In other words, uh, when if the people are uh, going to engage in that activity, uh, it should be low, uh, have greater depth and meaning and, and strength uh, as opposed to just you know being lustful everywhere, all over the place, all of the time. Um, I think it's a good exercise. I mean, somebody should just have to sit down in the back room and work out all, figure out what are the dirty words in the ISKCON that we use, you know. Um, <laughs> the, we, there's like dirty dozen, you know, you've heard about the dirty, dirty dozen. dozen. Yeah. <laughs> the dirty dozen in our English language that we use in ISKCON, yeah. Yeah. I think there's things to consider. You can, you can open almost any page and uh, find something that might be not so apropos for th this day and age. Yes. And uh, yeah, it doesn't come across so crass or harsh, but yet the meaning is still there. Definitely the rape is a good example. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, uh, I, I really... I really like the word casual, casual sex because that's what it has become. You know, it's such yes. a, it, it's become so, it's ironical that to some extent, the more sex is glamorized in the media, the more yes. it is trivialized in actual life. You know, it is just right. indulgence so trivially that it loses all, mm -hmm. all meaning or value. And right. yes, ma'am. So, and, uh, what about preach? What would be the alternatives for that? Teach? Teach also has teach. a little bit. Te yeah, teach or share. Share is, yes. Share the wisdom. If you're going to have a formal, you know, presentation, workshops are great. We use that term all the time. Uh, preach is just like, to me, it's just, I just want to block my ears. So we're living in 150 years ago. It just doesn't. Uh, <laughs> I mean, how we're, Talk about irrelevance, you know. <laughs> and people will say, well, Prabhupada used the word. Yeah, but Prabhupada expected us to use a language that people will understand. You know, he expected us to make adjustments. He made all kinds of adjustments, you know. He, uh, he allowed women to go on the altar and to do things that were not, let's say, considered to be fashionable in this time. So uh, he made so many adjustments, you know, considering the audience dealing with yeah so i think we also have to follow as he did you know yes Maharaj. 
the other point you made about gender inclusive language also or gender inclusive language so there actually there's an inherent problem in english itself english doesn't have a singular gender neutral pronoun there is he and she but there is no mm-hmm. neutral no gender neutral singular pronoun so when i write i sim- i have started using the word they they as equal mm-hmm. now they is not they is normally a plural word but increasingly it is being used as a gender neutral singular also that mm-hmm. so xyz went there and they did this so mm-hmm. yeah i think this is a right. you know, and and if you want to keep the singular i find the word person works a lot the person, person said it he uh, said it he went to, to do this such and such and say the person or like if there's a line says he will be self realized and and leaving out the she that's not very appropriate so the person will become self realized Oh okay. That, that is one word that can be used perhaps as a substitute. That makes sense. I do think that the translation is important and I think that if we want to be relevant to the world and not just kind of like be uh, left into the dust of the past that we have to look at words that are going to be dear to people's hearts. now at one level this all, like one point you mentioned at the beginning that you said that when you started traveling then you came out of the bubble of say the temple structure and started interacting with people to some extent mm-hmm. uh, it also happens to us as devotees that uh, you know we get caught in a bubble and we don't know how uh, how the outside world thinks and how the outside world perceives so we might continue mm-hmm. using the the words without understanding what connotations they have for people in the outer world mm-hmm. so to some extent coming out of the bubble is important isn't it and for you it happens i believe it is i believe it's like you like you're an incubator or you're like in a mother's womb and you're there to be protected but once you come out of the womb then you have to sort of accept the air and the sunshine and all the things that that are outside of the mother's womb or and you have to just simply get strong and that means some exposure uh, our, our movement cannot thrive if we're just staying in a building all the time we have to like reach out move out it's like you know yoga you have to stretch out if you don't do any stretches you're going to get all kinds of be confronted with all kinds of problems physically so in order to keep your body healthy and fit and strong there must be some stretches in order for our society to also be uh, uh preserve that uh, wholesomeness and strength and richness we also have to reach out and move out otherwise we will be stagnant it'll be like stagnant water like bad water movement is water is good when it's oxidized when it's moving so uh since you said we are a movement well we have to keep moving <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful and, and prabhupada has given us you know he's he started the movement and now he's not with us in a certain kind of way so it's our move now our move it's our move okay that's beautiful yeah and 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 in terms of presentation it's very important how we move what kind of food we present for instance even you, you, it can't be highly oily or spicy you know it has to be very sattvic and nutritious and we might have to keep dairy out uh, this particular in in a lot of what we present just so people will understand that we are consistent in our ahimsa culture and philosophy unless of course you have being some milk which is hard to come by so these are things that we have to sort through riddles that we have to um you know run run through and um again to be relevant i cannot claim to be a champion in this area of making those changes but i know that from walking for me walking out into the public uh makes a makes a big difference 
and it's helped me a lot to, to make adjustments. Now, I also write scripts, and when I'm writing a script, if I do it everything according to what I find in Shastra, BBT's printing, I will lose an audience. I need it to be more inclusive. I need I have to use a language that people can appreciate and embrace. You know? So uh, I think these are things that we are happy challenges that we in our culture need to look at all the time. Um, we need to assess and reassess instead of just sticking to what was there. And, um, you know, even in Shakespeare's books, he's, he would stick to the old language, but there's footnotes like anything, half the page is footnotes to explain what it was all about. So um, you're preserving a beautiful English language, but people need explanations at least. If not, then change the language <laughs> to a modern day comprehensible uh, you know, presentation. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, if I, even if I try to read Shakespeare as it is, it's interesting, but we miss out so much. Now, if yes, I, exactly. Without those footnotes, it's a, uh, like even in India, there are, there are saints who have written in the 12th century, 13th century. Uh, they have written in Indian languages, but even people of those languages can't understand things right now. Uh, yes. fact, for that matter, I have I know devotees in Bengal. Chaitanya Charitamrita is written in Bengali, but they say the Bengali now is different from the Bengali in which Chaitanya Charitamrita is written. So, <laughs> <laughs> I see. In that sense, yeah, we have to adjust, just like Chidan Charan, when I'm seeing you, you, you're wearing a kurta with buttons, right? This is not traditional Gaudiya apparel, right? I mean, in, in traditions gone by, sadhus would always just have unsewn clothing, you know? But you've got, you've got a kurta, which I understand isn't necessarily Hindu, influenced from Islam. And so you got sleeves, you know, you got things are sewn, you got buttons, and uh, we, we've adjusted for practical reasons, but we keep the core, the inner core uh, of what is Christian. We, we've, you could look at our culture, and there's been so many adjustments made. Like devotees love to use harmonium. That's not a traditional uh, Godia in, musical instruments. Traditional is the strings, you know, the vena and so on like that, and uh, various forms of drums. So ISKCON, or in the Gaudiya culture, we've adjusted, we've, we've accepted certain things and utilized them in our service to Krishna. So, you know, I think that's, we have to look at those types of things. Make, make the adjustments that will help our cause. Maharaj, that's beautiful. Uh, so, it's actually, it could be a whole subject of how our own tradition has been uh, responsive. You know, so that what we are doing being contemporary, it, we could also maybe in future have a separate discussion about how that has been. Being contemporary is a part of the tradition itself. It's not that we are doing mm -hmm. something different from the tradition. So being mm -hmm. faithful to the tradition also means mm -hmm. being faithful to the, to the aspect of the tradition of being contemporary. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so that could also be yes. one way of looking at it. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, yes, well put. Yeah, we cannot dilute the essence. The essence has to be preserved, but we must look at our packaging. I think that's really important how we package, how we, how we present. And I think we'll have much more success at reaching greater levels of audience by our you know, looking deeply and succinctly at these areas that we hold dear. Like, say for instance, some people are fussy about the printing, the, the books. They say they change the books. They change the books. Nobody changed the philosophy of this, this particular print. You know? But some people have an issue with that. They change the books. 
I haven't seen any philosophical adjustment at all. I, in fact, I've seen improvement, you know, dramatically. So people will take us more seriously. So just like this, you know, we have to look at that <clears throat> on all levels. The people that complain about the book changes, apparent book changes, they, they, they'll wear jeans. <laughs> Most of them wear jeans. They'll dye their hair. They'll be contemporary externally, but they, they've, they're kind of like frozen. There's a time warp in some people's devotees' lives that don't seem to want to. They don't want to shake it off. When it comes to um, when they joined, everything was perfect. Say 1975, everything was good. Why have we changed everything? Well, <laughs> the world is changing. We haven't changed the essence. You know, Krishna is still God, and Krishna is still blue. We won't change that. But definitely, our wrapping will adjust. At Christmas time in the West, people used to put all their gifts in a box with wrapping paper and a ribbon. Now, everything is put in a bag. Same gift items, but it's put in a bag with two handles, and it's got like some, some color to it. So the presentation has changed, but the object has not. Yes. You know, regarding time war, what you mentioned, I had a similar discussion with Kalakant Prabhu from Krishna House, and he made a very significant point that we have, we have frozen Krishna consciousness to the way it was in the 1970s. But even yes. during Prabhupada's times, the way Krishna consciousness was in the 1960s was different from what is in the 1970s. So 1960s, yes. he said that there was a very intimate family atmosphere and there was everybody was encouraged and included. But then the in 1970s, to some extent, the gender segregation became very rigid and uh, yes. other things came up. Yes. So you also second That's that? Right. That there's a, there was a difference between 1960s and 1970s significantly. Yeah, most definitely. Everybody knows a little bit about our history. The Radha Damodar Party, which was a, a group of traveling young men throughout America, especially, uh, they, there was, they had adapted to a sort of an anti grahasta sentiment, anti-female, anti grahasta anti-male, if you didn't toe the party line. Yeah, so that... Uh, you know, that family sphere, that charm that was there initially that became adjusted in around 1975, 76. Yeah, we saw a different kind of an ISKCON. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So this vision. So I, I think the key word, the key word is let us be inclusive let, and not so exclusive. And of course, it's important that Devotees have their own little environment, especially in brahmachari training. I think that is important. Um, like right now with the lockdown, I'm enjoying being in an, uh, um, a, t a temple which is predominantly male. And, you know, we're just, uh, life is a lot more regulated. And it's quite peaceful. And you're not, not dealing necessarily um, <clears throat> straight on with, community issues so much uh, and uh, so I'm enjoying the peace of it all but we do have to open our doors eventually and uh, to the greater community and uh, make everyone feel quite welcome yeah it, it, we have grown there's no doubt about it this gun has grown but we can grow so much more you know like I think of a place like LA it's a big city it has a wonderful center, you know, at La Cienga, where devotees are situated near Hollywood, I guess. But we should have so many communities all over the city, and grow, build, um, and somehow or other that can transpire. We just have to figure out how to do it. That whatever we are doing from, say, 1975 may not resonate with a lot of people. So. Let us be, let us become very relevant in the minds and the hearts of people. Mm. Let's go for it. Yes, Maharaj. So that's a very, I think a very positive note to conclude on then.
so uh, thank you very much for the discussion maybe i will just uh, like try to wind up what summarize what we discussed quickly mm -hmm. and if you want you could add something so probably we started by talking about uh, your experiences in uh, how you used to love to walk from your childhood and then you took that up and that also became your shelter as well as your distinctive offering to shri prabhu pad during his centennial as well as later on and mm -hmm. um, it's a more broader more subtle way of outreach so we all mm -hmm. find our own niche and in prabhupad had that uh, vision of, prabhupad was into numbers so we can also be into that but we can find the numbers that inspire us therefore you like it's miles how many miles you traveled so then we went i think um, we discussed about uh, we discussed about how for reaching out to the west uh, we need to do certain we need to be aware of western realities so that as far as uh, for western people today they are not interested in religious but they are interested in spiritual uh, and that spiritual means that we need to appear less trying to recruit and more trying to contribute to them where they are so that way our uh, those who are interested in a rural or traditional way of rural way of living for them if you present krishna consciousness as a way to raise their consciousness they can take it up and then later on we discussed about language and i think that was a elaborate discussion on being sensitive about language so common words like preach sinful then even god or <clears throat> cult or even i say uh then i added some more word like lust or sex and how we could use better words for them and uh, by this we don't alienate people prematurely and we give them the opportunity to uh, see us as reasonable thoughtful and then connect with us so prabhupad himself was relevant at his times and he, he wanted us also to be relevant so if it's a movement then it is for us to keep it moving now Prabhupad kept it moving at his times, and now it is for us to keep it moving. Yes, Maharaj. Yes. So, any other major yes. points I left out that you felt? Which yes. I, I, no, I think you've covered it very well. Um, while we adjust our presentation, we can't compromise on our inner core values. You know, we have to keep the Brahminical spirit very much intact. Uh, without the Brahmins, you can say. uh the visionaries uh we will we will fail uh, so uh we can't become you know our lights must be bright and uh i would just say that just to reiterate that we have just have to become a little more relevant you know and definitely be there for people less judgmental and uh you know work work hard at um seeing what what is in, on people's minds and uh i really feel a big part of our being successful is largely dependent on the application of our philosophy if we talk about protecting the animals well then we should do it if we talk about good wholesome food and offering god the best then we should do it you know we should cultivate the soil and mm. those kind of things. so i like like my experience here in the west i know we're trying to wrap it up but we see a lot of young professionals coming from india and participating most of them are interested in it you know uh that that kind of culture so okay where are the farmers okay maybe it's mexicans okay great well they're they're a nice group of people so let's cultivate them let's give them to love krishna through the, through the prasadam and through the music and the dance they love that so we just have to have those we have to get into areas where we can break the ice so to speak so um we really have to think the world's become more diverse now and just thinking that one model will suit all audiences is it's a hallucination it's a dream all right guys that's beautiful so we have one model reaching all people will be a hallucination yeah 
a powerful statement thank you very much maharaj wonderful talking with you thank you thank for your you. time all right hari bol krishna appreciate what you're doing so much please give my regards to everybody thank you very much maharaj